It's interesting that music can be scary, because so much of why horror movies or games work is because of the context. Music by itself can't show you a grisly death scene or a grotesque monstrosity, and it can't tell you that the killer is somewhere in the house right now! But at the same time, music can evoke the same kind of fear as all of these horror movie tropes, and in fact, without music accompanying the visuals, these games and movies really aren't that scary. Music is an essential part of the experience of horror as a genre. So, how does music create fear? How does horror music work? To explore this, let's dive into the piece Lacrimosa from Dead Space 2. Lacrimosa uses a lot of the different techniques that are used throughout the Dead Space games, which are truly the best horror scores in video games. I really believe that. The piece is written for string quartet, and the score was graciously shared with me by the composer himself, Jason Graves. Jason Graves actually has a series of YouTube videos detailing his approach and process in creating the score for the original Dead Space, so if you want to learn how to write horror music for video games, you'll find more insight there than I would ever be able to give. But if you want to break down his piece Lacrimosa and see what techniques it uses to sound so frightening, stick around here. Horror music is all about creating tension, and throughout Lacrimosa we see different types of tension created through three specific composition techniques. Atonal writing, aleatoric writing, and absolutely gross sounding writing. Lacrimosa wastes no time using absolutely gross sounding writing, introducing the piece with this quiet, unsettling intro that just makes your skin crawl. This type of sound is something Jason Graves has called in interviews the dementia motif, symbolizing protagonist Isaac Clarke's failing mental state in Dead Space 2. This effect is created by having the strings all play the same note, in this case an A, and then having some of the strings slowly bend the note up or down to the notes a semitone on either side. Playing two notes a semitone apart just sounds gross. It's a harsh sound that can be really uncomfortable to listen to. This is as clear an example as I could want of what dissonance in music means, and that quality is what makes the semitone crunch an extremely helpful tool for creating horror music, where the goal is often explicitly to make the listener feel uncomfortable. And if playing two notes a semitone apart sounds gross, sliding from one unison note to two notes a semitone apart, hearing not just that semitone clash, but the two notes getting gradually more out of tune with each other. This creates a palpable feeling of anxiety, and it's a brilliant representation of Isaac Clarke's tenuous grip on reality in the game. This is a great way to open the piece, but writing music that sounds gross doesn't have to be this experimental. Sometimes it can be as simple as choosing one off note. Isaac Clarke's theme, his motif that recurs throughout Dead Space 2's soundtrack, is made up of four simple notes. D flat, E, A flat, D. These four notes spell out the word dead. Very clever, right? And they instantly instill a sense of dread in the listener. It looks more complex than it is. If we respell the figure to C sharp E, G sharp D, we can see that it's a C sharp minor triad, one flat three five, that ends on the flat second note of the key. Starting out with a minor triad is already a dark sound, of course, but sitting on that flat two note at the end creates the sense of going from bad to worse. And isn't that what horror stories are all about? The flat two of a key is a particularly threatening sounding note, an idea I've explored more in depth in my video on the Phrygian mode. See, there's an art to choosing notes that'll sound gross, and the right combination of dissonant clashing notes can really make a listener sweat. These two statements of Isaac's dead theme in the cello are followed by a series of very tense chords in the higher strings.
The secret to these kinds of ugly dissonances is in the intervals used. Certain intervals between two notes just sound tense. We've talked about the semitone crunch, and the tritone is the most famous dissonant interval, but major seventh intervals can also be quite unpleasant. These four chords in particular all feature a tritone interval on the bottom of the chord, and then build on top of that unstable foundation with some kind of major triad, and then an extra major seventh interval added on top. Importantly, the top and bottom notes don't gel at all with the major triad in the middle. Try and name these chords and you'll immediately see how good of a job Mr. Graves did avoiding a sense of tonality. We're a long way from E minor here. The sound used can have a huge effect on the type of horror you can create. These chords are played quietly, in a high range, and with a glassy sound created by directing the violins and viola to play with their bow above the fingerboard rather than in the typical bowing spot, a technique called sultasto. This is perfect for this eerie kind of sound, but take the exact same kind of chord, using tritone and major seventh intervals, drop it way down low in range and have the players play it by aggressively snapping their strings, and the same notes produce a perfect jump scare. The wide variety of tonal colors string instruments can produce is why they've been staples of horror music since Hitchcock's Psycho. Violin infamously can sound very screechy in its high register, a quality that is usually avoided but explicitly used in one of the creepiest parts of Lacrimosa, this haunting rendition of Isaac's theme scored way up high at the top of the violin's register. The dead theme is repeated in various permutations, first ending with a natural second, D sharp, which sounds much less dark, then moving to the original version with the flat second ending, taking the music for a creepier turn. The dead phrase is repeated two more times, moved up to start on an F, and then on an F sharp, with each iteration of the motif harmonized with more and more dissonant clusters. The sound of this phrase is caused by the use of harmonics, high, piercing tones created by players only lightly touching the strings of their instruments rather than fully pressing down each note. Used together with regular playing in the upper register creates this chilling, ghostly texture. Like the high range of the violin, these piercing harmonic notes can be hard to listen to, but this discomfort is key to making the music feel scary. Case in point. This last note, where the strings all slide up to the highest note they can grab on their instruments. That's just a gross sound, and that's perfect when the goal is to make the listener's hair stand on end. I wasn't kidding about the highest note they can grab comment. The actual score directs players to slide up to an unspecified, very high note. This is a simple example of aleatoric composition. Aleatoric music is a term for making yourself sound very well educated, and it just means that some element of chance was introduced into the musical performance. These techniques range from letting performers choose the exact note they play, to graphic scores where players are reading an abstract drawing and deciding what and when to play based on their interpretation of that. The difficulty with aleatoric techniques is figuring out how to get the effect you want, and how to communicate that to the musicians clearly. In the second movement to Lacrimosa, Graves uses aleatoric techniques to create disturbing soundscapes, like this skittering, creepy-crawly section.
The score shows this effect was achieved by directing the musicians to play harmonics quickly across all four of their strings. The notation suggests the desired speed and erratic contour of the notes to be played, as well as giving dynamic directions with crescendos and decrescendos marked for players to follow. But the players are deciding the specifics of what to play. It would be impossible to synchronize three players playing this wild and fast if you were trying to notate exactly what notes to play when, but even if you could, that wouldn't actually work as well. The chaotic randomness of this is part of the desired musical effect. Even with just the music, that felt like such a classic Dead Space jump scare. I could almost see a necromorph bursting through my ceiling when that note hit. This is a perfect example of the one-two punch of horror, a growing sense of dread building up into a shock. In this case, the dread was created by the creepy crawly harmonics, and the shock was delivered not by the sudden appearance of a space zombie that looks like you ran a person through a garbage disposal, but by a cluster chord of four semitones stacked on top of each other, played very loud and suddenly with the direction to use a scratch tone to make the notes as ugly as possible. Ugh. I'm not sure which is uglier, the monster or the chord. This chord leads into another aleatoric technique, the unspecified lengthy glissando. Much like the piece's intro, the players are asked to slowly slide from one note to another, but this time each instrument is gradually making their way from one dissonant cluster chord to a bigger, even more dissonant cluster chord. The specified target notes are placed four bars apart at a pretty slow tempo, and spending so much time sliding up a relatively short distance lets listeners sit with out-of-tune notes, and this many of them together creates an overwhelming dissonance. This perfectly captures a feeling of growing dread. It gives you the pit in your stomach that you would get knowing something nasty is coming for you, getting closer with every passing moment. As the strings slide higher and higher, players are one by one instructed to play these skittering, chaotic lines, building up into a frenzy. The actual notes and rhythms don't matter that much as long as the players get the intended effect. And you can see this in the way the score leaves the note heads off of the stems by the end, the players allowed to just go wild. The cruelest part about this building dread is that the piece leaves us hanging with it. Instead of building up to another jump scare stinger, the strings gradually shift from skittering high notes to these wailing siren noises, again produced with aleatoric instructions to slide up to unspecified higher notes and come back. This unravels into a dejected silence, giving a big enough pause for you to think the threat has passed. And that's when it gets you. Good God almighty! I bet the recording sessions for these types of pieces are actually really fun. That assault on your senses was accomplished by instructing the players to play random high pitches with slow bends on their highest strings at a triple forte volume. This is the musical equivalent of gore in a horror game. It's hard to watch, but it sure gets your blood pumping. Aleatoric techniques are perfect for the gruesome and the grotesque, but if you want something more subtle in its approach, you might want to check out the third A of our set, atonal writing. Atonality is the lack of a felt home key or chord. It's music with no points of resolution and no way of coming to a resolution. This kind of tension is less in your face than the two semitones rubbing together. It's more like the psychological terror of losing your grip on where you are and not being able to find your way home. This solo cello melody toward the beginning of the piece starts with a motif moving from a low C up to a C sharp, then making a huge leap up to the C an octave above before settling on the B, a semitone below that.
If you take out the change in octave, it's easy to see that these are three notes a semitone apart from each other, C sharp, C, and B. And these three notes alone don't create any sense of a home key. None of them stands out as being home bass. As the melody continues, this initial idea is repeated but extended into a longer chromatic line, the continuous step down in semitones interrupted only by this leap down to an F, a dissonant tritone leap from the note before it, which manages to maintain our sense of keylessness. The thing I love about this melody is that it feels like a melody. It's phrased like a melody. There's a big dramatic leap that moves down a step after, like melodies tend to do. There's motivic consistency as the second phrase repeats the first musical idea but expands on it. But these very melodic elements are missing the core part of every normal melody, a tonal center. It's very emotive while maintaining an atonal tension throughout, beautifully capturing the desperation of our main character. Writing music that specifically does not have a point of resolution is a skill in itself. People are really good at feeling the key of a piece of music, of intuitively understanding what note or chord feels like home. And even music with lots of chromatic twists and turns can still have a key center, which is the technical term for the note or chord that feels like a place of rest. Writing atonally successfully, as we see in this cello line, imbues the whole phrase with a nervous energy as we keep waiting and waiting for some solid ground to put our feet on that never comes. Lacrimosa is a stunning piece of horror music, but maybe my favorite thing about it is that it ends the way a horror movie would end. In the third movement, the cello sets up a mournful, repeating figure that runs through almost the entire section starting off with our main dead motif and alternating it with this outline of a D-sharp minor chord. The other strings come in one at a time over top of this bass loop, gradually building up the music into a repeated C sharp minor to B flat over A flat to D sharp minor to B over A sharp progression. It's not atonal, it's actually kind of bitonal. The C sharp minor and D sharp minor chords don't fit into a key together, and the chords between them, transitioning back and forth from one to the other, have a kind of sickly feeling to them as they wrench you out of the key you were in and push you to the next one. This pattern keeps repeating and building up gradually over the course of the whole movement, with the upper voices climbing higher in range and getting more and more rhythmically intense as the bass line keeps its rock-solid foundation. Right when the crescendo brings us to a boiling point, the strings cut out except for the first violin holding the super high C-sharp note, and then we get a few different iterations of our dead motif to bring this piece to a close. It feels just like a horror movie, where the hero's managed to escape from the monster and is on his way back to safety, definitely worse for wear, not totally intact, but still alive. And just like in a horror movie, right when you think it's finished, the piece throws one last scare at you. The final dead motif plays out under some more dissonant high chords and then lands all the strings onto a C-sharp note, held just long enough for you to think that that's the end before they all start sliding down, 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 like the pieces melting around you and you get one last jump scare to drive it home.
There is so much of Dead Space's character in this music. I'm stunned at the way this piece manages to juggle thematic writing, aleatoric techniques, atonal unease, moments of disgusting dissonance, and put it all together with such a strong direction. La Cremosa feels like it tells a story on its own. It holds up as its own solitary work and even manages to feel scary without the context of the game. This is truly a masterpiece of video game music and of horror writing. Thank you again to Jason Graves for sharing his score with me, and thank you all for watching. Check out my Patreon if you want to support what I do, and Happy Halloween! <laughs>